Okay, welcome everybody to my talk, Pipeline Pandemonium. Uh, first things first, uh, you, you know, these are all my opinions expressed by me, not by my employer. So who am I? My name is Blake Hudson. I am a offensive security engineer for PayPal. I've been there roughly about two years now, and I've kind of started off with the whole color wheel, essentially, of jobs. Originally was a blue teamer for a small MSSP in my local area quickly transitioned into red teaming for a Department of Education uh, contractor. And then from there, I have now transitioned over to uh, PayPal as a full red teamer, mostly doing a lot of purple team activities there. I have roughly six plus years of experience within cybersecurity at this point, uh, really specializing in infrastructure and cloud um, security and technology. And again, this is my first time speaking at a conference, so it's a little nerve wracking to say the least. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, I will say this is not something that I ever anticipated doing in my career. And, you know, from a lot of friends, family, coworkers, uh, they all kind of pushed me to do this and, you know, take the deep dive, share my knowledge with somebody. And, you know, I honestly, I recommend everybody else do this at some point in their career. So, all right, let's jump right into it. So, what is a CICD pipeline? Well, in real simple terms, it is basically how. Uh, to help developers uh, make and push their code changes faster and with fewer errors out to their staging and production environment by automating a lot of that testing earlier in the software development lifecycle and then the whole deployment process. And the CI of that does stand for continuous integration. And this involves basically having all of your developers kind of use GitHub or some sort of Git repository where they push all of their changes to in, in a shared repo. And then they run automated tests on it to catch the errors earlier within the code and the software development lifecycle. The CD of that is, I've seen it both ways, continuous deployment or continuous delivery. Uh, pretty interchangeable term. But this is where once the software has actually passed these automated tests, it is basically the automation of pushing your changes, your code fixes, to your staging or production environment. And it really helps with that process because it helps deliver that code quickly and reliably to your end users. Kind of follows this standard you know, pipeline here where you can see it starts with planning what you're trying to do. You code it, build it, test, release, deploy, operate, monitor. And it's this cyclical pattern where you know, as you're monitoring it, you, you notice you have some sort of errors in there. You go ahead and you know, plan the next life cycle of it. You code it, you build it, and it just repeats over and over. So who are the kind of common providers that you're going to run into? Well, at Jenkins. Everybody knows Jenkins. If you've done some sort of internal pen test before, you've come across Jenkins. You've probably exploited it dozens of times. It is documented to death. It is all over the place. Very, very interesting attack paths there. Some of the other ones that I run into a lot are CircleCI, uh, Team City. Very minimally, it's mainly kind of like a, I, I, I feel like I see it used as a kind of like a test bed. And then GitLab, I see occasionally. But the big one, and the one that we're going to be focusing on today, is GitHub Actions. I've, in my experience, I feel like a lot of organizations are transitioning to GitHub Actions, because it's right there. It's built into their GitHub repositories as it is. There's no third-party you know, SaaS application or other infrastructure that you have to stand up to interact with it. It's just it's there. It's enabled by default, so why not use it? Seems the easiest option. So again, some of the common uses for CICD pipelines and today's major organizations are things that we've already kind of covered. Automated testing, all of those code quality checks to catch the errors earlier, uh, version control, your artifact management, where are these things going to be pushed out to once they've been built and deployed, and your entire workflow orchestration. So the one that I skipped here, though, is IAC deployment and infrastructure as code. Um, so typically a large organization uh, who has a very large cloud presence, they're not going to go in and what's called click ops. They're going to go into the management console, click configure this, click configure that. That's where a lot of kind of mistakes happen. Uh, large organizations tend to have everything uh, defined out in some software, uh, coded out very specifically for what they're trying to do, to do everything at scale and at massive, massive scale. So today we're going to be talking about that infrastructure as code uh, management portion. And in particular, again, we're going to be talking about GitHub Actions, because I see that the most right now, and particularly just AWS. But it really can be applied to any of the cloud providers. So obviously, why do we want to test them? It's pretty standard, right? 
Uh, we want to identify any of the vulnerabilities, misconfigurations within the organization's software deployment lifecycle and the CICD pipeline's architecture, components, and processes. It's also to really help prevent any sort of internal threat actors from poisoning any of the organization's dependencies or softwares or, you know, uh, uh, deploy deployments of code. And uh, during tons of different red teams and inf internal uh, network engagements, it's pretty common to target software developers and get their level of access to where all of this is really possible. So when do we actually test them? Me personally, whenever I'm doing a, a cloud assessment, I always like to get my standard roles of view and read only for, say, AWS. But because everything is typically defined in code somewhere, say Terraform, state files, things like that, I like to also ask for uh, permission within their, say, Git repositories or their CI/CD pipeline uh, framework. It just makes a lot of sense. And in my experience with, say, cloud environments, when you're doing a pen test, you, you will still find some misconfigurations here and there, but I see the vast majority of the major exploit paths coming from the CI/CD pipeline and abusing that heavily. Uh, there's obviously you could do CI/CD pipeline specific assessments. This is this is pretty rare though. I don't get asked to do this very often, uh, but it is a way that you can do it. Red team engagements. Obviously, this is a very huge pathway to go, and unfortunately, in my experience too, there has been time and time again where organizations, especially large ones, aren't actually sending logs from GitHub to their you know their SIM or their CDC or SOC, I should say, but there is, so you're kind of operating in a blind environment where they're not really paying any sort of attention and it's just on the developers themselves to identify anything. And then lastly, uh, internal network assessments, uh, pretty common as well. Once I get sufficient privileges and in inside of an environment, I always like to try to pivot to the cloud, try to take that over as well, kind of show the more risk with the fact that you're just trying to, you know, demonstrate more value to that entire assessment. Who needs permissions, right? Well, <laughs> turns out you should always ask for permissions before you start messing with these things because organizations can be very, very sensitive with you interacting with these things. Uh, kind of like I already discussed though, uh, when I'm doing a typical cloud assessment, I like to look for or ask for that standard developer user within their repos. And if they're using GitHub Actions, that's gonna give you the access that you already need. Uh, also asking for their standard pipeline software access, so things like Jenkins if they're using a third party uh, framework. Now, a lot of organizations are going to kind of push back against that. They don't want you in there. They don't want to get, grant you the access or they say, you're a hacker, you get in there. Um, I always like to try to push back against that because try to really demonstrate and explain to them why this is such a dangerous area and potentially very, very vulnerable to privilege escalation or full cloud compromise. So a lot of these CICD frameworks are gonna be very, very similar. If you know how to exploit and manipulate one of these, you can kind of take that same basic uh, common knowledge or like ground level knowledge and transition it to one of the other providers pretty easily and quickly. And uh, a lot of them operate off of YAML files. It's not gonna be the exact same uh, syntax, but you can very quickly figure out what that is and then transition to that to, to basically do the exact same thing that you're looking to do. So let's actually look at some of the typical paths that I tend to exploit a lot of different ways. So starting with the basics and the obvious, uh, once you get access to that Git repository or all of their Git repositories, you wanna do the simple searches. And this is obviously a kind of a, yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is not an extensive list by any means, but the things that I like to look for, the AWS access keys, GitHub personal access tokens, huge. This can be, the end game for them just by gaining access to those uh, GitHub personal access tokens. Jenkins API credentials, you could actually turn that API credentials into full console access to Jenkins with uh, Burp Suite. Circle CI API creds. Uh, Azure client ID secrets, maybe you can authenticate as a um, uh, service principal. GCP service account keys, I see these up inside of Git repositories just sitting there, pushed up to a random repo, and a lot of times they have things like editors permissions on the specific GCP project, which grants you the ability to then start creating tokens for all other service accounts. Uh, obviously Terraform Cloud API key, that can be extremely dangerous as well when you're searching for those. Uh, I've been in plenty of engagements where I have just found that in a random variable inside of a Git repository. Do a simple search and you find Terraform Cloud API key, you might have full admin of their Terraform environment. Kind of game over at that point. 
So the one that I skipped over here is runs on. This is a particular variable that I also like to look for as well. This is in all of the YAML files for a GitHub action. And this will indicate to you that they're actually using it. So that search bar in GitHub itself is actually really, really good. And I like to do all of these searches manually. Yes, there's very good tools out there, things like uh, Truffle Hog. They do an amazing job of covering very large organizations quickly to find a lot of these secrets. But I do feel like it misses things occasionally. And it's just better, in my opinion, to go and do these searches manually. So what's another way to kind of help you narrow it down? Uh, well, obviously, you can look for these specific folders within their Git organization to see what they're using, things like Jenkins file or any of the dots. Dot circle CI, dot GitHub, Harness, and Team City. Some of it might be legacy and they're not using it anymore. And I come across a lot of repos where it will be like a circle CI and a dot GitHub folder in the same thing. Are they using both? Probably not, but at least give you an idea of where you should be looking and what you should be looking for. So some of the more interesting paths. And this first one is I do it constantly. Uh, I've probably done this thousands of times to steal secrets from every environment that I get into. Um, so first off, though, is that open your eyes. Everything with a GitHub action is going to be almost right in front of you. Read through their YAML files of their actual actions. It will tell you so much information. How are they interacting with the cloud? Are they using standard roles, open ID connect roles? Are they pulling in secrets from more, somewhere? Uh, are they pulling it from Secrets Manager or from the actual repo itself? Are they assuming into other roles that might have different privileges? All sorts of information that you can pick out specifically just from reading the YAML files. So the secrets, where are they actually being stored? Well, each CICD provider actually has specific locations where you store the secrets. And in GitHub, there's two locations, either at the organization or the repo level and inside of the specific settings for that, and then secrets and uh, variables. You can see that there's this highlighted uh, box there. For Jenkins, it's obviously the credentials uh, URL. For CircleCI, it's gonna be underneath the organization's context, and then there's this environment variables. GitLab, it's gonna be underneath the project settings uh, CICD variables. Team City, it's gonna be underneath uh, the actual projects parameters inside of environment variables, and then harness.io, another common one that's kind of up and coming, but it's gonna be in two places, either the project or the organization settings itself. So we know where they're being stored now, and this is where a lot of organizations are actually storing these things. How do we actually get access to them? Well, typically you can't. Even as an admin or a code owner of the repo, you're, if you go to click the edit button for this, you're just gonna be overriding it. So you can't see that clear text value of it. However, any of the pipelines that you actually configure to interact with it, we'll be able to access those. And that's the, the pivot point where we're able to then see the clear text credentials. So again, reviewing all of the existing YAML files that are in there, you might be able to see that there is a specific format, something that is like a variable name, dollar sign, curly bracket, curly bracket, secrets dot variable name. And that is gonna be exactly what you wanna be looking for. So, Something to keep in mind too, these secrets, they might be stored in there and no YAML files are actually calling them anymore. And since you're not a code uh, repo admin, you're not gonna be able to see that these secrets actually exist there. It's also very, very slow to do this manually, going through every single repo, looking to see if there's secrets in there, being called by any of the YAML files. So I actually had ChatGPT just spit out a script for me to see if it would work. And I just had it spit out a Python 3 script that will take a GitHub personal access token, because I come across those constantly, and then iterate through every single repo it has access to, extracting out the secrets name for that repo and the variables names. And when you run it, it looks something like this. You can see we've got two repos here where they are storing secrets, and uh, this is exactly the information that we need to start actually pulling these secrets out and using them. So we're gonna focus on this bottom one, the CICD abuse as we could see that the secrets are typically also named exactly what you might think that they are. AWS access key, you know, GitHub bot, things like that. So how do we now get to these? Well, pretty simple. You just go ahead and create a new branch. Sorry. <laughs> uh, very simply, you just go ahead and create a new branch of that repo. That happens all the time. Developers are always creating new branches. You add in your new malicious YAML uh, file to that specific branch. Commit it to your branch, 
profit. It's pretty pretty simple, um, especially once you see what the YAML actually takes. Um, you'll notice something here, though. I didn't say that you need so any sort of social engineering. You don't need to convince someone to approve a pull request or even review any of your code changes. You're just pushing to your own branch and executing things. So this is what it looks like. Uh, so we knew that CSCD abuse um, repo was vulnerable, and we go went ahead and created our new branch, created this extract.yaml file, and then kind of stepping through this, the name, you can name it whatever you want. Sometimes you want to probably name it something that's going to blend in a little bit better compared to their other actions. Uh, the second line there, on push, that's the trigger point. This is saying as soon as I commit it to my branch, it's going to execute this action and do something, perform something. Now, once we get into the jobs here, you can see this environment variables and this AWS access key, AWS secret key, that's the exact format that you're looking for to identify that they're storing secrets within their repository and they can be just pulled straight into your environment variables of your runner. Uh, this runs on key, that's what operating system that you're going to be executing all of this on. And then we'll, we'll kind of jump into the rest of this here in a second. So you go ahead and commit this to your repo, uh, your branch of the repo. And if you just try to do something really simple, like echo out those secrets, well, each of the providers are going to be fairly decent at identifying that, that that is actually a secret and stop you. And they're going to mask it. How, how difficult is it to actually get around that and then just start seeing the clear text keys? It turns out very, very simple. They have a very, very rudimentary masking technique. So first one here, we just, what if we print out the keys one by one? All right, yeah, you can do that, very slow. Uh, what do we know about AWS access key IDs? They're all alphanumeric and uppercase. What if we just simply text manipulate it and lowercase everything? Doesn't catch that as a secret. You now have the clear text access. Um, we can print out the secret keys, uh, split it in half, cut, print the first line, and then on the second line, print the second half. And basically any text manipulation will get past their secrets identification. Uh, my favorite, the last one, I just like to base64 encode it, spit that out for you, copy it out, decode it, it's yours. Something to keep in mind though, um, if they're using, uh, for instance, you can see here that runs on Ubuntu latest. That is actually saying that it is using the default GitHub Actions runner. Um, if there is something that's named differently than that, kind of that format, you know they're very likely using custom runners. Something that they're, they have up in, say, the cloud somewhere, they're pulling it down, it executes the action that you're trying to do, and then it destroys itself. If that's the case, you really want to get in the habit of dumping out all of the environment variables because you don't know what else is already hard-coded into these environment variables for that particular container. I've found Terraform Cloud API keys in there that got me full admin of their Terraform environment. I've found other GitHub personal access tokens that gave me admin access to several repos. Tons of potentially really good information in there. So. What about the situation where the organization doesn't want to give you access to their GitHub? Oh, actually, I skipped ahead there. Uh, so this is just to show you, if you base64 decode that blob from the environment variables, you can see we have all that sorts of information in there. Some of it might be useful, but you can see that we have the AWS access key and the secret key in clear text. Perfect, now we can pull this into our own CLI, start using that however we want. Um, so. In the situation where they don't want to give you access to their GitHub repositories, it happens. Uh, I have had to do this before in a real engagement. I had basically ChatGPT spit out another Python 3 script for me that will, you point it at a code owner or a organization, a specific repository, and then it's going to go and create the new branch for you. Then it's going to create your malicious workflow file or action, and then basically you commit it, it push, uh, gets pushed to your branch, executes immediately. And this one in particular, obviously, since you don't have access, you won't be able to see this console output. This is just to show you what it looks like. And because you don't have console access, you can't see the output of the actual action running. So you wouldn't be able to steal the secrets. But in this case, do the exact same thing. Pull in all of the secrets into the environment variables, and then just base64 encode the environment variables to a text file, and then curl post request it to a system that you have on the cloud that's listening. Now you have all of the environment variables, base64 decode that, and you have full access to all of those secrets as well, even though you never had console access to their GitHub. 
be mindful of that, though. You are sending secrets out across the internet. Uh, that may not be a good idea. Uh, there's probably safer ways of doing that. It's just kind of get your head uh, moving in the right direction of how you can get these if you don't have access. It's pretty interesting, too, because you, know, you just started off with a GitHub personal access token. Use the first script to iterate through, see where the secrets are, target them specifically, run the second one, and steal everything. So that's if they're storing secrets in the actual uh, repositories themselves. A lot of organizations are going to use things like Secrets Manager as well. And again, reading through those YAML files, you might see that exactly and what secrets they're pulling in. And you could just copy that exact same code and put it into your own YAML file. So here in my AWS lab, I just created this prod secret key. And I created, again, a new branch with this YAML workflow. We're going to be pulling in those same secrets because through our enumeration, we found out that we have Secrets Manager access. And then this highlighted box here, this is all the steps it takes to then access their Secrets Manager, assuming you have those IAM permissions. When you do this as well, it's pulling in the secrets and then putting them right in the environment variables, ripe for you to steal as well. So just because they're being stored in a better location doesn't mean that you can't access them. We're going to base64 encode these, steal all those, and you can see that we got uh, access to that prod secret key, super secret key, and super secret password. So we can steal secrets from all over the place at this point. Uh, secrets Manager, there's ways to do it for HashiCorp Vault as well. Uh, GCP Secrets Manager, all really the exact same thing. So what else can we do? What's next? Well, again, the common theme, read through their other YAML files. You might notice that this organization is trying to do things kind of correctly, or at least more secure. They have a a typical role that they're executing, say, low-level permissions with, and then they are assuming into another role that's where they're doing more administrative tasks, create new users, uh, assign you know security policies, things like that. So reading through their YAML files, you might notice that, hey, we really want to assume into this other role. And through our enumeration, we figured out that we could assume into this particular role, this deployer prod. Again, this is all it takes to do that. Uh, that uses line, AWS Actions, configure AWS credentials. That is actually a GitHub repository. You can go there, read through all the documentation, and see exactly how to use this, as you might need to adjust things depending on your environment. We go ahead and commit this to our repo, our branch specifically, and we can see that first we are running as a deployer prod role, or pre-deployer. We have successfully assumed in, and then we became that uh, full deployer prod. And through our enumeration, we figured out that this is a full admin. And this is where you can kind of go two ways. You can continue to just issue commands directly here in the pipeline and to achieve whatever you're trying your goal is, or pull out these secrets in the environment variables and put it into your own AWS CLI and have access for that for about an hour. Typically, roles are configured at a minimum for an hour and uh, at most for 12 hours, but I've never seen more than an hour. So. Uh, Let's just continue issuing AWS commands directly here inside of our pipeline. Issuing three more commands, you could just go ahead and create yourself a new user, attach that IAM admin policy to it, and then set a password. Now we should be able to have console access as a full admin. Just to confirm, yep, it got pushed up to our specific branch. We have that new offsec user with admin access, and we could log into that console. A lot of times it's just a lot easier navigating through the console as, uh, you know, to view certain things. It's just a lot easier than the CLI. So some of the actual restrictions that you might run into, and this is one that I've actually come across quite a few times. Um, when you create a role, you have this tab for trust relationships. And in this case, I created a OpenID Connect role. So it's basically allowing uh, anything from GitHub to assume into your role uh, if it meets certain conditions. And in the output here, you can see that one of the conditions, the top one is repo, and that is BitLegion, that's gonna be the organization, CICD abuse, the repo itself, and then pull request. And so you know to interact with this role, it has to be coming from a pull request, and then the second line is defining that it has to go into the main branch. Pretty standard. And honestly, the first time I came across this, I thought I was dead in the water. I thought there's, well, I can't get this key. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to social engineer somebody to you know, approve a pull request. But this doesn't actually say anything about actually getting it approved. You just need to submit a pull request. So if we try to actually execute this, um, it will fail. Once we commit this up to our branch, we can see that the actual action failed. Well, 
that's mainly because we didn't meet any of those conditions. The action executed before a pull request was opened up and, you know, so that condition wasn't met. So how do we actually get around that? Well, it turns out GitHub has a lot of different triggers and reading through these, you might have one that will specifically um, show you your use case. And when you're, uh, for this particular one, there is a trigger for on pull request. So nothing will execute until you actually open up your pull request. That sounds like it's gonna be perfect for our specific uh, scenario. Go ahead, commit this to our branch and uh, open up our pull request. Once that's open, it automatically executes our GitHub action and you can see, hey, we met all the conditions and we now have access to this role. Again, you can start issuing commands through the CICD pipeline by adding to your YAML or just uh, pull out these secrets again and base64 decode it, put it into your own CLI, use them all you want there for the next hour. Now on say like a red team, submitting multiple pull requests, that might be pretty loud. Uh, typically a lot of places are gonna get, send out emails like, hey, there's a uh, code review that needs to happen and you're likely gonna get caught even if you go in and close it out real quick. You might skirt under the radar, but it might be easier or better to just go ahead and pull these keys out and use them externally at that point. Um, and this is just to prove, you, you know, uh, I had a thought at least the first time when I pulled these secrets out, well, it has this specific trust relationship, so you can't use these keys at, outside of the actual pipeline. That's not true. You already met the conditions and those keys were granted and they're valid for an hour. So you can pull them out and put them into your own CLI and continue to use them. So this next one is one that I actually came across uh, in my consulting days and it's, it's pretty interesting. You're, you'll probably notice almost immediately what's wrong with it and why it's really bad. They were trying to do the right thing and make their trust relationship really re more strict to interact with their roles, but they ended up doing pretty much the exact opposite. So this Open ID Connect role, you can see the trust relationship itself is uh, repo bit legion star slash star colon star. That is basically saying the organization star, so the organization has a prefix, what repo? Any repo, because of the wildcard. And then what branch? Any branch. I'm sure some of you already know exactly what's wrong with that, but let's kind of play with that. So in this particular engagement, I just went ahead and thought, all right, well, any branch within that organization or any repo. So I created an arbitrary repo, created my own um, YAML file and uh, committed it to the branch, which then assumed into that open ID connect role. Successful, yeah, we met the condition. Pretty simple, right? But the real interesting thing from there is that wildcard for the organization. Since it was bit legion star, that's, that's a prefix. I can put anything, you know, I created a whole new basic um, Gmail account with bit legion test that fulfills that condition. And then any repo from there and then any branch. So created my external repo with a, again, a, an organization that's not uh, familiar or has any sort of relationship with the main organization. Go ahead and create this YAML file, commit it to my, my specific repo, and we can see that we added full access to that as well. So this is pretty bad because they're allowing a unknown, completely unrelated GitHub um, repository interacting with their AWS account. And this is a great form of persistence and, um, you know, some random repo out on the internet can be interacting with your AWS environment and all based off of one wildcard misconfiguration. So you might be thinking, how do we actually go through each and every one of these roles to see what the trust relationships is? That's very difficult, time consuming to do manually. If you guys have never used it, uh, big shout out to Bishop Fox for their tool CloudFox. It is awesome at doing all sorts of uh, situational awareness for cloud environments. And this one spits out a ton of information, specifically one file that shows you these trusted subjects where you can see the, the actual role name, it's provider, so it's OpenID Connect provider. And then these uh, trusted subjects, that's exactly the conditions that we were looking at uh, for each of those. And then is the role an admin or not? So you, this really will narrow it down and help you target specific roles within the environment. So again, huge shout out to Bishop Fox. Uh, and then just for fun, this is one that I have done in the past. This was a particular engagement where I got uh, access to their Git repositories and they had one in, in particular for their entire Terraform uh, scripts. And 
I gained access to roughly 15 or 16 different GitHub personal access tokens and was trying to explain to them that I had full control over their Terraform uh, repo. They didn't believe me and they wanted me to actually try to do something, try to push a change. So what you can do is once you get your hands on a lot of these GitHub personal access tokens, well, you might be able to, they might have sufficient privileges to actually do something. In this case, the organization required three different code approvers and then the own owner to then merge it into the, the main branch. Turns out I actually had enough keys to do that. So in my own branch, I went ahead and just updated the um, readme file. Up, I put updating this readme at the very bottom of the, uh, the file, committed it up and opened up a pull request. Then I went back and created a new action to execute these curl commands. And as soon as I push this up to my repo, it's gonna, uh, each of the GitHub access tokens needed was gonna approve. And then I'm gonna hit all of my approvals. And then the last one is gonna be to then uh, merge it into main. Yes, these are just curl requests. You can do this in the CLI, but I thought it was much more interesting to kind of demo it in their actual CICD pipeline. What it looks like in the console output is you can see that it was approved and then successfully merged and I was able to actually update their readme file. Uh, so I, I was at that point able to verify and prove out to them that I could change basically anything within their Terraform repository fully compromising their cloud. Um, have done it before. It's, it's been a while since I uh, was able to do that, but it's a really interesting attack path. So how do we actually protect ourselves? Well, I, I feel like a lot more research needs to be done into this, and I, th I think the CICD pipeline providers need to be a little bit better themselves about identifying secrets. But it does come down to being very, very mindful about what IAM permissions you're assigning to each of your roles. And it really comes down to strictly adhering to that principle of least privilege. You don't, you really want the roles to be sufficiently, you know, provisioned to exactly the roles or the tasks that they're set to perform. Uh, if they're just moving files around from S3 bucket to bucket, there's no reason to give them IIM permissions whatsoever. One of the things you want to consider too is, uh, do, do your developers really need access to every single repository? And that's usually a blanket thing. If you're a developer, you're going to have access to every repo in the organization. Really unnecessary. Um, and because with that, you might be able to use specific runners from different repos into different GitHub repos as well. So there's, you gotta have some sort of delineation to show that this specific runner is for say the finance team and this runner is specifically for an infrastructure team or web app team. You don't want to cross use runners or GitHub repositories for s several different tasks. These uh, creating roles with restrictive trust relationships. Uh, I haven't come across one that was really, really great that fully blocked me. But uh, I think a lot more research needs to be done into that of really how to lock it down to a specific action. And really, you don't want, it, it's, it's kind of a hard line too because you don't want to restrict developers from doing their jobs by putting t too many hoops in front of them. But you also have to balance that with the security of it and make the, um, the actual action itself have a specific trust relationship so it blocks anyone from coming in and just executing any of these and stealing the keys. Something else you can do is enable AWS Guard Duty, and this will uh, use AI and machine learning to help identify if the credentials are being used in any sort of suspicious way. In my experience, though, eh, this is pretty hit or miss. It's missed a lot of things that I've done uh, with some of these access keys. It's supposed to be able to see that, hey, it's not coming from a GitHub action anymore. It's being used in a CLI somewhere, and it's no longer usable. Um, so it's, it's been real hit or miss. Then you can also um, limit the lifetimes roles session tokens. Obviously, the default is always going to be an hour or 60 minutes at the at the minimum, but never set it for 12 hours. That's pretty unnecessary. And that does bring us to the end. So I kind of flew through that. But does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Thanks, great talk. Um, the, a lot of this seems to be leveraged on getting access to exfiltrating the GitHub secrets mm -hmm. and using a third party branch outside of the main repo to get access to those. I don't have a ton of experience, but I thought that those secrets were protected from external repos. So maybe you could talk about how that 
works and how you might defend against that if they're not indeed protected from third party repos. So say that like that last trust relationship that I showed that had the, the wild card attached to it? Is that what you Well, mean? that was having to do with uh, getting access to the IAM stuff, but this is more earlier in the talk where you talked about exfiltrating GitHub secrets in Base64 to bypass the exfiltration protections. Mm -hmm. But I was like, oh, I didn't think you had access to those secrets as a third party repo when you're running the CI. Well, no, so you're actually running it inside the organization. You're just creating a new branch of one of their repos that is storing the secrets itself. So then is this more of an insider threat type? Yes, of? Exactly. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, okay, great, I missed that, yeah. yeah. So then with an insider threat scenario, is there a way of defending against that? Unfortunately, I, like I kind of said, there needs to be a lot more research into this kind of protections. Um, personally, I think the, providers themselves or the frameworks need to be much better about identifying the secrets. I've talked to GitHub about it before and they their response was essentially, well, we can't prevent people from willingly exposing secrets. So they don't necessarily. So you can do environment protections, which is similar to. So you can use environment protections as uh, well, the secret can only be uh, available for example for the environment production mm -hmm. and then you have to um, run it on the main branch <laughs> or in the production environment and okay. in that way you can uh, protect at least against just random branches accessing the secrets. Okay yeah I've, I've come across that in my experience it's it seems like a lot of organizations just kind of leave everything open and the thought process is oh, you have to be a developer or have very high privilege access just to get into the Git repositories or be able to execute things. So they just, they lean on that a little bit too much. But good to know, thank you. Sorry if I'm bogarting the mic. Um, but in that scenario, how do you do CI? Because the point of CI is to prevent errors before entering in the main branch. So if it only runs in main, then it's too late and your bugs or errors or you know attacks from the red team have entered into main. Yeah, it depends. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, that's a good point. Any other questions? Don't be shy. You mentioned getting caught through uh, uh, pull requests that triggered like an email to go review. Mm -hmm. How else have you been caught doing these? You know, I, I can't even say that that pull request one actually did get me caught until probably months down the line when someone reached out to me. For the most part, I kind of talked about it a little bit. Um, a lot of organizations, in my experience, aren't pushing their logs from GitHub to their SOC, their SIEM, and it's kind of just on the developer's laps to try to catch all of that, which they're not doing. So a lot of times you can operate kind of uncontested in that environment and not a lot's gonna catch you. Um, I've done it time and time again over the past couple of years and I've, I don't think I've ever had anybody reach out to me except for months after the fact, like, hey, was this you trying to do this? Oh yeah, that's a, that's a branch I left up there titled offsec on accident, whoops. <laughs> but if you clean up after yourself to close out all your pull requests, you might, you might be able to just skirt completely under the radar for quite a while. Any other questions? I'll, I'll, be stick, yeah. I'll be sticking around too a little bit yeah. for if anybody has any questions after the fact. Now I saw people taking uh, pictures of the sleds, so I know you guys were curious. If, I, if I'm up here with social anxiety, I know you guys can ask questions. <laughs> all right, like you said, he'll be up here to uh, answer any questions you all have or chat, so. Cool. That's all. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.